Hello, hello, it's me once again. Today I'm going to be drawing Luna from Hell of a Boss. I almost said Has Been Hotel. It is not Has Been Hotel. It sort of is, but it is not. Okay. So you're probably wondering what is Eli going to talk about this video? I don't know. I have no idea. Um, I just knew that I wanted to get another video out while I was in the middle of preparing this gargantuan video that I'm writing now. Actually, it's kind of complete as far as the writing goes, but I did a word per minute to time conversion and it turned out to be two hours long. So it might take a while, especially for a video that most of you probably will not care about in the least. So that's going to be fun. I love, uh, I love it when I ruin my own channel, which is every day. Yes. Okay. I have watched the entirety of this series up until now, not counting any sort of, I don't know, spinoff things? Has there been like a comic or something like that? I don't know. Uh, if there has been, I haven't seen that. But as far as the YouTube stuff goes, I've seen it. And I was sitting around thinking, uh, oh, I gotta, uh, uh, this is how I think. I was sitting around doing that, trying to imagine for myself what in the world I could conceivably draw for an art gripe, because they're relatively easy to create, especially if I'm doing other things in the process. And I was trying to think of anything that had been sort of recent as of late that would still fit within the criteria of being furry smut bait for you uh, disgusting perverts out there. You clearly late 20s to usually mid 30s perverts. I know exactly who you are because that's the only people that watch my channel. Um, and I thought of Luna, because that's a character that I realized, oh, I've never really drawn her, I guess. Or if I have, I don't remember drawing it. And that's something that's been happening lately, because I noticed that the first episode of the second season just came out. So in case you're wondering what predicated that, there you go. Um, I'm not going to be... I guess I'm not going to be going into spoil. There's really not much to spoil about the show, I suppose. There's sort of one core thread to the characters, and you can sort of realize what that is in the first episode of the first season. But I will say I did find it interesting that the... I did watch a little bit of the pilot episode to sort of reorient myself. I'd find it really interesting that the... First episode of the second season basically rehashes the pilot episode in a way and goes into more detail about the context for everything that happens, in a sense. Uh, it, it, it doesn't replay those events or anything, but it does give you way more information about the characters, which I appreciate. Because the first season is mainly sort of hijinks, and this usually is... This happens with every single cartoon that I've ever seen, and for the most part, most series that are like this. Um, there is usually some sort of... There's some sort of thread that goes through the center of the concept behind whatever it is that you're creating. And that is something that is explored in the first season, and then after that they realize, well, we can't just keep doing the same joke over and over and over again. A good example of that that I usually think of is Adventure Time, even though it wasn't necessarily a pen ward that did this. It was a sort of, I guess you could argue, studio interference or just, you know, new writers or whatever. Um, but Adventure Time started with this... Like, if you watch the pilot, it has a very defined sort of, um, not theme, but a very defined atmosphere to it where it's just Finn and his magical dog brother having adventures. And it's all very whimsical and high energy and fanciful, but there's really not much to it. There's not really much substance beyond that. And that's great, that is, that delivers the right kind of energy that you want from a children's cartoon. But it doesn't really go anywhere in the long run. And once you sort of exhaust that tone you eventually have to start doing things with the characters. And the same thing is actually also true of... This is the oldest example of uh, this sort of idea that I can think of. 
It is also true of, like, old newspaper comics. Because that used to be, like, the thing back whenever old people like myself used to read the newspaper. Um, for things like... Oh, fucking Garfield or whatever. Um, or, like, BC. Or... I was trying to think of Kathy. Fucking Kathy. Jesus. <laughs> um... You would read these things, and sure, the jokes would play out, but I've read numerous interviews with um, the people that create these things, and they admit, after a while, you know, you try to have one or two days where you just sit down and just come up with a ton of ideas all at once, so that you don't feel drained whenever you have to draw these things day to day. And that's sort of what you do whenever you're an artist as well. You might come up with a bunch of primary ideas and just have a big stack of them. And then go back to them later and go, uh, I want to do this one. That way you don't have to worry too much about it whenever you're on an off day, that sort of thing. Uh, the same deal with uh, newspaper comics. You would make a newspaper comic about, you know, Garfield. Like, oh, he's a... Like, the, the original concept of Garfield, the joke, was that Garfield is a cat that is doing cat things. And that's it. Uh, like the, the entire crux is that he would do things that are cat things, but then sometimes he would do things that are slightly not cat things, like smoke a pipe. Like if, if you've ever wondered about that, like there's sort of a meme. It's not really a meme. I mean, it's an actual comic of Garfield of him just uh, John wondering, where's my pipe? And then it cuts to Garfield and he's smoking the pipe. And then John says, Garfield. And you might wonder, like, people that read that today might wonder, what's the joke? Like, is, what, is this nomedy? Is it non-comedy? And no, that, like, that used to be the actual joke. <laughs> That's a really old comic. And the entire crux of it is that cats don't smoke pipes. But these days, Garfield is treated like such a, um... Garfield is like a, the original suction cup on hand stuck to your the back of your windshield sort of mascot character. And as a result, the core concept, the core conceit of him just being a cat has sort of eroded over time. And now he's like fighting space aliens and going on adventures and just other stupid bullshit. So the entire joke of he's just a cat no longer makes any sense to anybody that has existed in the modern day. It's, it's nonsensical. So whenever you look at old um, comics like that, it makes absolutely no sense to most people. But even putting that to the side, um, I'm trying to think of Far Side? No. What is the name of the... What is the name of... It's like the main character's name is Luann... All the characters are blonde-headed. They're drawn in this very particular... It's sort of an ugly style. I can't remember. But uh, that one sort of also switched to being sort of dramatic in a way. Uh, anyways. I was trying to think of a good example of this, and I can't off the top of my head. But there's lots of examples um, of those things in newspaper comics where they would just have the joke like that. Like, it's just a cat. Um, and then over time... Actually, Garfield itself is a good example of this. Um, because over time, Garfield started... A lot of people don't remember this, uh, because you weren't alive. Uh, started developing new characters. Like, for the longest time, John had a best friend. I forget what his name is, but he kind of just doesn't exist anymore. He just went away. And uh, he also had, like, core family members that he would visit. And those were prevalent during, like, the 70s, I think. And... Uh, they were sort of used to tell little minor storylines, even in fucking Garfield. And they weren't, like, uh, cry-me-to-sleep stories or, you know, hold your, your loved ones dear as you read Garfield stories or anything. But they were there. Uh, but a lot, of, um, a lot of those little Sunday comics did end up developing into, like, dr dramas in a way. Like Dagwood. Dagwood's a great example of this. Dagwood is that stupid comic where it's... The wife is hot. Uh, <laughs> um, where Dagwood eats a big sandwich. And he goes to work and he's late. 
and that's the joke. It was it's like a really really old comic. I don't even know if they even make those damn things anymore. It's probably been handed off to five or six different people at this point. But that's the joke. Uh, but even early on in that series run, the core idea I think was that the girl actually came from an extremely wealthy family and. Her father did not approve of her marrying this loser, Dagwood, because he was like a useless doofus that would never amount to anything. And um, that was sort of the first like big storyline push of that series. Otherwise, the day-to-day -day is just Dagwood sandwich. Big, meaty sandwich. He loves to eat big, meaty sandwiches. Uh... Mailman, um, not being on time for work, just everyday, just things that aren't funny to modern people, but, you know, this is what it was back then. Anyways, um, I've seen numerous interviews with the creators of those sorts of comics that say you eventually run dry on ideas. Or even if you don't run dry, you eventually start to lose your mind trying to come up with something that's funny every single day. So you always have to resort to a storyline. You have to start actually telling some sort of continuity story that people can care about and get invested in that isn't necessarily going to be entertaining on its own merits. Um, like it, 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 There has to be more. It can't just be that same thing over and over again. And that's what happened to Adventure Time. Adventure Time um, was just that silly romp you know, uh, beating up snowmen or whatever, and then punching the Ice King in the face. And they did that for a solid season. But that runs out really, really quickly. Uh, you can't have a... I know a lot of people got really upset whenever it started becoming more dramatic. And I'm not talking about the whole Finn shipping debacle with, like, Flame Princess and all this other stupid bullshit. Uh, much earlier than that, even. A lot of people were upset that it was not that same inane, whimsical, pointless stories that don't go anywhere. Like the early Enchiridion episode or something. Um, that they were actually focusing on uh, things, like anything at all. Like characters, plot lines, things like that. Uh, they just wanted it to stay exactly the same. But you can't do that. Not only because it gets really tiring, but also because that appeal kind of just stops after a while. You can only watch so much of that before you just get fucking sick of it. And all that said, um, I was mentioning this because with this series, I feel like it's sort of doing that. Not to say that it started badly or something like that. Um, because the core premise of Hell of a Boss seems to be it's an assassination for hire group of wacky characters that interact with one another. And they go on little hijinks adventures where things go wrong, or uh, there's some sort of get-rich-quick scheme, or this something like that happens. And it's mainly just about the characters being very over-the-top and not even overly cartoony, but sort of adult comedy. Like, in-your-face. Like, it has a certain attitude to it. Uh, but th that's just sort of the core conceit to the way everything's presented in the show. With the first episode of the second season, that is, and even as the series kept going on, that feels like it started getting not quite played up as much as the characters became more characters and not so much just two-dimensional. Like Luna, for example, in the first, in the pilot episode, uh, she's introduced, she chugs some crap from the refrigerator, she makes some angry phone calls or receives angry phone calls. And runs out into the street and kicks a baby, I think it is. And, you know, it displays her personality. She's very gruff and rude. But uh, very, not sporty, but sort of a, she's not alt or anything like that. I don't know what the what a good description is, but you can look at her and tell what she is. Um, that only goes so far. And uh, over time, you see more of her actual personality. And uh, like, so even she sort of changes over time. And not really changes, she just, that two-dimensional aspect of her gets toned down a little bit. Uh, so whenever you get to season two, sure, the 
characters are still acting like themselves, but you definitely get more of a impression that they're telling a story now, as opposed to just hijinks. All that to say, that's a good thing. Because whenever you are making characters like that, the initial presentation should be strong for those characters. And this is something that, in writing, everyone always struggles with. Uh, one of the... One of the biggest problems in writing is not necessarily what your book or whatever is going to be about. It's how do you start the damn thing? Because even if you know the general idea behind how something starts, even the first sentence can be extremely difficult because the, f the first few seconds can make or break people's desire to actually watch it. Uh, the same thing is pr true of like interpersonal relationships. Um, a lot of people say to just be yourself uh, when meeting new people, and it's sort of true, but as I said, I think even in the last video, uh, whenever you're being yourself, you should still have a variation of yourself that's not too intense. That way you don't immediately weird out everyone around you. Like, you don't want to have your bar cranked up to 11 all the time. Like, I have an, ele I have an 11. If you've watched me, I have an 11. A big, fat, meaty 11. But I'm usually not at an 11. I'm, like, in this video, I'm probably, like, at a, a good, solid 4 or 5. Just, like, an ordinary, nice, unassuming man. Just nothing weird here. Nothing strange going on. I don't need to worry about that. I don't have to worry about it at all. No. Okay. Um, but whenever you first meet someone, whenever you first run into someone... You do want to sort of ease people into whatever your personality happens to be so that you can ease into whatever their personalities happen to be. Everyone's nice and e easy. No one's being threatened or anything like that. Why did I even bring this up? I can't remember. Oh, uh, yes, introducing things. Um, so even in real life, making a good first impression in the first few seconds of seeing someone can, 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 not to stress, I know... I know my audience. I know a lot of you immediately. Oh, oh he's right. Oh my god. Oh my... No, 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 don't don't worry. This is, it's not that big of a deal. Um, they can make or break things. Just you know, whenever you're meeting someone, don't open up like showing them cat memes, and don't immediately start making fart noises with your armpit or something. Just don't do anything fucking weird. Just you know, tr try to act like a human being for like a split second. I mean, sometimes. Sometimes you will run into the right person that is also a fucking weirdo. And the the moment that they perceive, oh, this is another one of me. This is also a fucking weirdo. Then they will immediately be attracted to you in some way, or they will immediately be very curious. That can happen. But you're also playing a bit of Russian roulette with 99% of the population of the planet. Whenever you do that... So, it can definitely work out. There are no right or wrongs. I'm not going to tell you to do it or to not do it. I've had it work out really well. I've had it work out very poorly. It just depends. I've even known people that, in hindsight, do act exactly like me. But just the fact that that day they get, were weirded out for whatever reason, now I'm not allowed to interact with them ever again. Even though if they had just not been such a hard ass that one day, everything would have been fine. This is how it goes. Yeah, this is this life in general. Um, but point being, whenever you're writing a story, you need to come out of the gate strong with the right message, the right characters. So whenever you, you're writing your first few sentences of something, the first few sentences of your novel or the... Uh, dramaturgy you're writing, whatever it is, uh, need to exposit not only what the story is about, what the tone is, who the characters at play are, what is most vital, and what the ultimate message is going to be. All of that needs to be encapsulated in the first, hopefully, sentence. Like, even if the first thing someone says, you know... Um, like, even something as simple as, what was it, call me Ishmael? Like, even something as simple as that. You know, you're still directing someone, like, um, this is someone who's still alive, he's talking directly to you, you're being told a story. Even something as simple as that can really heavily 
direct uh, how you view the rest of what you're going to read. Uh, so just opening strong is very important. Uh, same thing is true in like a pilot episode of like a an animation. If you're going to introduce your characters, what is the first thing that they're going to do? What's the first thing that they're going to say? Uh, what are their first actions? Because all of those things have to be the most whatever that character is cranked up high enough that people can tell, oh, this is what they are. Because if you take, like, me, for example, I'm a character in my own right, but like I said, I'm operating at, like, a five or something right now. So if you introduce someone to this video, and this is the first time that they'd ever heard me speak about anything, it would probably not be a good indication to them of what exactly I'm all about in every single respect. They would just think, oh, it's someone that draws vaguely furry smut and makes boring videos, and you would say, yeah, yeah, pretty much, but there's also a lot of other stuff. And they won't care. But if you show them the Pokemon parody video, whatever it's called, select your partner, um, then that's probably the most plague thing to see, where you get a strong indication of almost every element to my personality, aside from the analytical, like, video breakdown sort of stuff. And even then, it's sort of there in a weird way. So whenever you introduce Luna on screen... Luna needs to do the things that are cranked up to 11 to make it clear exactly what she's all about. Because you don't want to introduce a character at a 5. Where someone just walk Like, if you have Darth Sidious walk into a room and he, like, gets a sprite out of the vending machine. And then sees a guard and says, what are you doing? And the guard goes, oh, uh, hello, Lord Sidious, uh... Just about to go take a dump. Insidious is just not, uh, he's sort of out of it. He, like, he just got up out of bed or something. He's like, Arr. then he walks off screen. Not a very good first presentation of that character, is it? It's Darth fucking Sidious. You already know what he's like, but in the context of this little straw man argument that I've just make, made up here, um, you're not being delivered the information on what exactly that character is and what they're all about. But if the first time you ever see Darth Sidious is after a whole movie of go of people going like the Vader going, well, I'm a badass, but oh, I would never mess with uh, Darth Sidious. And then all the other characters are like, oh, Sidious, whew, I'm glad he's not here. And you just keep hearing that sort of in the background. Then by the time that you get to the second movie and Sidious shows up on the screen and you hear like the, the dragging of something across metal grating and then you see like you see like his huge horse cock being dragged across the floor and that's all you see as his, his silhouette emerges from the shadow and he's he's like immensely muscular and there's just lightning shooting off of him and he has like five glowing red eyes and then he opens his mouth and a bunch of like desiccated crows from hell start flying out and uh a soldier trips and falls in front of him and drops all of the spaghetti out of his pocket. He's like, oh, my, oh, my spaghetti, oh, my, oh, oh, jeez. And Sidious looks down and he's like, mine. And then he grabs the guy and like just splits him in half with his horse stick. Like just doesn't even fuck him, just like uses it as a sword. Just like splits him in half, tears him in two, throws both sides opposite directions. And then he just, like, walks off screen and then, like, looks slyly over his shoulder and, like, winks to Vader and Vader giggles. You know exactly what's going on. That's a strong presentation of that character. You might, yes, you might be confused, very confused, but you know exactly what this character is all about. That is, that character termed up to 11... Not the real character, the, the horse cock version I just made up. That is that horse cock version that I just made up. Turned up to 11 so you know exactly what is going on. Great, great initial presentation. <sighs> so I get why Luna kicks the baby. Makes perfect sense. So anyways, whenever you're first starting any sort of 
show. Uh, doing the initial pitch is one of the hardest parts to do. Because in your head, you have all of the depth of what that character is. You know, everything there is to know about them. Uh, if, you, if you've done your planning. You have a perfect understanding of what they're about. You know all their potential. You know all the storylines that you're going to tell. So, in a way, you feel almost like you deserve to succeed. Because to you, all of this in your head is really meaningful. And it all of its potential is going to be realized. You just need the green light to be able to do it. But no one else knows that but you. All of the stuff that's in your head is just locked there, and no one's ever going to see it until you actually have the the funding, the time, the manpower, etc. to be able to pull it off. So whenever you make that pitch, you have to make sure that that pitch is something that is going to succeed. Um, I know that um, Chris and... Uh, I can't remember both of their names off the top of my head. But Smiling Friends. Smiling Friends is a great example of this. Um, cause they, what's the first thing they did? It was, um, basically just the two of them, except they were drawn as just, you know, sort of those Oni characters where it's just, a like just a circle head and they had their little expressions that they do. And they, Hellraisers was that the name of it? Hell, it was Hell something, I think. Anyways. Uh, the first time that they made a pitch, and I don't feel like I'm criticizing too much here, but the first time that they made a pitch and they did their pilot pitch, it wasn't a very good uh, attempt at doing it, I would say. And that's because, again, this is not to belittle them in any way. They obviously have succeeded to a great extent. I really enjoy uh, how uh, Smiling Friends turned out. Um, but the character designs were not that strong. They weren't really exhibiting the character traits of the characters in their physical designs. The pitch itself was not particularly strong because it was just a vehicle for their kind of writing. Uh, the actual, like if you just wrote down the pitch and delivered it in an elevator or something, then it would just, it, it would be, it would sound incredibly generic. Uh, it was something very hard to sort of get across to someone's desk and have someone that is not them give a shit about it. Because I'm sure in their head they understood the potential of what they could deliver. They just didn't have the pitch for it. Um, and that show that they were initially trying to ship around was not the best vehicle for actually delivering that. Whereas uh, Smiling Friends, obviously much better results, uh, much stronger pitch, um, much more successful as a result. And again, very happy for them uh, succeeding the way that they did. Um, the turn, like, whenever I first saw that pilot, I did think, eh, that's not a very strong pilot. And then years later, whenever I saw Smiling Friends, I thought, this seems familiar. Because, you know, I'm not that in the know about what they do. Um, and it wasn't until, like, a, a couple days later that I realized, oh, th the same guys. These are the same people that did that thing. And I was actually really amazed by the fact that they uh, came so far. Like, they... Like, a lot of people, I, I don't know really much of anything about the industry, um, and I think that was also part of the problem, is uh, the main pitch man, I can't remember who of the two it was, um, I, I guess all of them, but they had to learn a lot about the nature of the industry and trying to work within it and how best to appeal to people that are in control and things like that, and um, it's, all of it is extremely difficult. So the fact that they were able to succeed despite all that, in spite of all that, is really amazing. And uh, same thing sort of goes for this, uh, Caliba. Um, it seems like Has Been Hotel came out first. And I don't know anything about the story behind all this. But there were Has Been Hotel, and there was uh, also Hell of a Boss. Has Been... Hotel seemed more like a series pitch idea, and Helova almost seemed like a spinoff in a sense. Because Helova is much more contained. Whereas Has Been Hotel seemed more focused on establishing a setting. But uh, it feels like Helova gained way, way more traction because it was so much more focused on 
being engaging up front as opposed to has been, which was more focused on trying to establish characters and establish um, sort of a working relationship with the world around them. And I remember um, has been the animation seemed uh, not quite as put together, although I don't know why. Uh, I, I don't think it's because of the, the work. It's probably a time limitation thing or they were just getting started with the technology. I'm not sure what the whole story is behind all of that. And again, not don't mean to be disrespectful in any way. Um, but point being, Helva is the thing that I have seen the most of by far since then. So if there's a story behind that, I would not be too surprised because Helva seemed to have much more of a strong presentation up front. Anyways, <clears throat> whenever I pause, I'm taking a drink. I tried, like myself, I tried to stay engaging whenever I'm doing this commentary, but... Oh, um, this and streaming. Whenever I stream, I still do this. I still try to talk nonstop and engage with the stream chat, and it just wears me down. Like, it really tires me out over time. I don't see how some people just... I keep that energy for, like, eight hours a day. D to me, like, I do it for, like, one hour. I can feel it. Once I'm at four hours, I'm about to lose my mind. And then I'm fine. Like, if I stream to, like... Hour five, usually I start to feel oh, sort of okay, but then realize I'm feeling physically bad. And um, after I start to feel physically bad, then I will either have to end almost immediately or I'll keep going and feel really terrible the next day. It's like hanging, uh, having a hangover or something. <clears throat> okay. Um, if I had this drawing to do over... I would probably make Luna a little bit more lewd, I guess. Because, I, you know, there's this is one of those characters where it was the same way with... Um, uh, there's a character that came out recently. But there's been, you know, there's been a few... Oh, um, what's, her, what's her face from Elden Ring? The um, Ronnie? Ronnie the Witch? Man, I forgot Elden Ring existed, even though I was doing an LP of it. Boy, do I... <laughs> I have no interest in continuing that for the time being. Um, uh, Ronnie was very popular, but lots of artists that are way better than I am, like way better, were drawing her, and she, whenever they drew her, she was fucking amazing. Like, this breathtaking artwork, because she has the whole, like, magical aspect to her, and she has all the limbs, and she's very shiny and just very blue, so she's very saturated. So a lot of people that are more focused on, like, painting and making things look realistic have these extremely elaborate, like, she's very sparkly and extremely gorgeous, and just everything about her is very elegant and beautiful and inspired. And here I am, just like, hey, big boobies, <laughs> whatever, whatever I do. Um, so I thought, why, why would I draw her? Like, it's already been done, and it's been done way better than what I can do. And I know there's the whole, you know, one artist makes a cake, and then another artist makes a cake, and the, the other, other artist says, wow, their cake is way better than mine. But the consumer says, ooh, two cakes. I get it. I, I understand, but in my mind, the cake that I was making, that I can make, was just so... Like, so many other people had made similar cakes, or cakes that are better tasting or bigger or whatever else that I just thought, you know, there's other things I could be spending my time on. And that was my logic. And same thing with Luna. Lots of people have drawn Luna because she's very, very popular. And she's, she's very popular for a very obvious reason. I think there's a joke in like the final episode of the first season or the next to final episode where they break the fourth wall and they basically address that Luna has become very popular, especially amongst disgusting furries, like, you know, you. <laughs> you thought I was going to say something else, didn't you? Um, but it should be obvious why. Like, um, the thing about making these sort of... Um, not, I, I don't want to call them alt chicks or anything like that. She's not an alt chick. Um, about ma making these uh, not 
like avoidant of normalcy style characters, because that is a huge umbrella that covers a lot of different things. With her, obviously, it's like goth, and it's mixed in with uh, her sort of cantankerous uh, attitude that she has. Uh, she's very irreverent. And um, people that are also sort of in that camp appreciate female characters that are like that, uh, because that makes them seem more... Like, we're more empathetic towards characters that are like that, because they are not nice, and they're seeing what their mind is, and we just appreciate about that about them. Uh, they make for good, good characters. Um, so for uh, gross internet nerds that like furries, yeah, of, of course she's very popular. Why wouldn't she be? Uh, she was basically custom made for this sort of thing. Um, even something like, uh, you know, Zone had the recent uh, Anka uh, craze as a result of that, the um, Minus 8 cover. And that's for obvious reasons, even though Animal Crossing has nothing to do with any of that stuff, the pure design of the character is still fitting within the mold of that sort of idea. Because her expression is communicating that same idea, even if the character is not actually like that, and her physical design can also be translated visually as being sort of gothic in a way, which is also doing the same thing. Uh, the internet loves that shit. It's really popular. People love that stuff. So it's no surprise to me that Luna was popular. Although, personally, I think my favorite one is actually Millie. I Millie is the wife of Moxie, if I remember their names correctly. I'm not that... I watched. I have not watched uh, the entire series recently. Um, I did enjoy it. I, I like everything about it. But uh, it's been a while. I really like Millie. She's super cute. Uh, she doesn't seem to belong in hell, though. Because, again, the entire premise of this show is that they are all demons that are living in hell, and they carry out assassination contracts, whether it's actually in hell or in the human world. And the hell of a boss group is uh, not supposed to be able to get to the human world, but they are able to anyways, because in the first uh, pilot episode, uh, he steals, uh, Blitzo steals um, a book. That allows him to do so for, you know, uh, MacGuffin style reasons. So all of them are demons in various ways. And how that works is kind of interesting to me. And it seems like something that was going to be more present in the Hesman Hotel show. But it's sort of touched on briefly in uh, Hell of a Boss. But it seems like humans get sent to hell... At which point they are turned into demons. And the physical shape that they take as demons sort of resembles whatever they their behavior was in life. So if they were, you know, uh, if they were very weaselly, they'll look very weaselly. If they were grotesquely uh, greedy, then they might be like huge and rotund and, you know, visually represent greed in some way. Things like that. But, supposedly also, I, I think this is mentioned in Hesman Hotel like once, but uh, the physical size is limited in Hell for some reason, and it's actually running out of room, and that's, or maybe it's a hell of a boss, and I think that's part of the reason why people are getting killed off. So supposedly things can die in Hell, but also you can also reproduce in Hell, so you can still have children. So I guess that's the logic of where characters like Millie came from because she doesn't really she may have been a human at some point I really don't know uh, she doesn't really seem like it though because she's very sweet she's very sincere she seems like she does not belong there at all but she does love to murder and she gets extremely violent and kind of feral whenever anyone threatens her husband Moxie but that's about it as far as her negative characteristics. But I really like her. I really like her because she has that sort of attitude that I'm attracted to. Where she's... Uh, she's not stupid or anything, but um, she is played up as being like kind of southern and folksy in a way. Uh, and that has a connotation of dumbness because, you know, America. And um, But for the most part, I'd say that she's uh, fairly bright. Uh, she's not like stupid. 
Like, she's uh, fairly intelligent in her own way. And well put together and very sort of heroic, even though she's a demon. And she's very empathetic and loyal. And those are all traits that I really like. I think Millie is best girl. That is my opinion. And I am correct. <laughs> I am absolutely correct. Okay. Um, here we go. Final image. Um, was happy to be done with it. Again, if I had had it to do over, I would probably want to make her more suggestive because I feel like this one is a little bit too vanilla for me. I didn't even do the thing where I like have her looking intently into the camera, which is the your point of view, and it's like borderline romantic, but in a very uncomfortable way. That's my whole MO. But I didn't do it this time. Hmm. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. Really, I just wanted to make sure that I was able to show off her entire body at the exact angle that I wanted to, but also show off her hair and her tail. Because I really like her physical design, and her design in the show is very tall. Like, she's very tall and lean, and she has a very specific build. And I wanted to try to capture as much of that as I possibly could, without actually... without actually losing too much focus... So I had to sort of scrunch her up in the only way that I could while still retaining that, which is sitting down. Uh, otherwise, I would have had to change the resolution, and this would not have been a 2560 by 1440 uh, standing, vertical. So anyways, you got the idea. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video. I will try to put out another one as quickly as possible, although I still have to record two hours. Two hours of me talking about game design. Okay. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.